Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are joining us from today, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kalina from Business Review, and I will be your host today. It is our pleasure to have LTS with us today, who will be presenting this webinar titled Microarray Patches, Case Study for Interferon Beta and Hepatitis B Vaccination. Today's guest speakers are Dr. Marcus Winterberg, Head of Analytical Development, Microbiology and Quality Control, MAP Innovator. Dr. Frank Theobald, Head of MAP Program. And Dr. May Pitting, Director, Business Development, North America. I would like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. You will notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link that you received via email to rejoin the session. In order to ask any questions, you can do so via the Q&A widget at the top right corner of your screen. Just type in your question and click Submit. Towards the end of the session, we'll allocate some time to address any questions or thoughts that you may have, but even if your question doesn't get answered today, it will be available to be answered at a later date. But now, please allow me to welcome Dr. May Pitting. May, over to you. Thank you, Kalina, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Before we get into the star of the show of the MAP program, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on LTS, the company, and our capabilities and overall um, general history. So we are the transdermal market leader. We have over 1,500 employees. Last year, we had a revenue of over 300 million, 350 million euros. Of that, we reinvested into R&D of about 8% of that turnover. We also invested into capital equipment and facility upgrades of about 25 million euros. We have patent families numbering over 200. Our capacity to manufacture oral thin films and transdermal patches is over 2.5 billion systems between our three manufacturing facilities. We have over 40 cooperation projects ongoing, and I'll go a little bit into that a little later. And our production area between our manufacturing sites is over 60,000 square meters. And speaking of those sites, our headquarters is in Andernach, Germany, where we do manufacturing and R&D. We also have two sites in the U.S., in West Caldwell, New Jersey, and St. Paul, Minnesota. R&D also can happen in St. Paul. And we have a business office in Asia, in Shanghai. As for our delivery platforms that we can offer customers, we have the oral thin films or OTFs. These are very thin polymer films that release their APIs via the mucosa of the mouth. We also have our transdermal therapeutic systems or TTS where patches are applied to the skin and the APIs can act systemically or topically. We also have our tops or our topical patch systems which are flexible, ready to use and designed to deliver a range of topical therapies. And then the star of the show, the microarray patches, which are placed on the skin. There are tiny microneedles that penetrate the uppermost dermal layer and then release the API into this dermal layer. As far as our, our business model, primarily we develop innovative drug delivery products with our proven drug delivery technologies that I just went over. We can scale these up and manufacture these developed products. We can also act uh, strictly for contract manufacturing, um, but our activities are focused solely on business to business to pharma and consumer health clients. So LTS manufactures commercially, but we do not market any of the products we produce. We like to think of ourselves and we are a full service provider. Customers can come to us at any stage here um, where they can come to us with a new chemical entity or a hope that they can for, we can formulate a generic uh, copy for them. Uh, we can perform analytical RD. If you've done a little bit of work yourself on lab scale, we can do process development and scale up. We can provide clinical samples, commercial supply, as well as primary and secondary uh, packaging. At LTS, we like to think of ourselves as a technology company, so we never stop exploring and innovating. That's why we continuously refine our core TTS and OTF technologies and invest in emerging drug delivery technologies such as the microarray patches and smart patches. 
So a little bit about the business models. I spoke about earlier the cooperation or collaboration projects, and we have over 40 ongoing right now. With these projects, the partner selects the API, typically a new chemical entity or a generic copy like I mentioned. Perhaps it's a specialty product or um, the API is in a different dosage form and the customer would like to do some life cycle management and put it into a patch or an oral thin film. So LTS acts as a full service provider and we are reimbursed by the partner for our activities. Currently, we have multiple products that we commercially manufacture that are on the market that were collaboration projects. And we also have many in development as well. These projects are under the partner's control, so we do the work and you make the decisions. Uh, we also have proprietary internal projects where LTS selects the API typically for an unmet medical need. Um, and then we select the, the technology platform, so oral thin film, uh, transdermal patch, tops, or map. We do some predictive screening. We fund the R&D and the clinical activities. Currently, we have three CNS programs completed in, uh, that have completed a phase one study, one that's partner, uh, a couple, the other couple are further in partnering stage, but we have multiple additional programs in preclinical stage. So like I said earlier, we do not market any of the products that we produce commercially, so we outlicense these projects upon success after phase one. And with that, I will turn it over to Frank. Yeah, thanks, May, for um, the nice introduction. And um, I, I will now to give you insight in, in respect to the organizational strategy of our LTS MAP program. And I'm coming back to what May already announced uh, in presenting the LTS business model and our core competence. So we see ourselves as a CDMO and we see ourselves as a drug delivery enabling company. That means we would also not market the MAP products our, our own brand name, but we would like to develop together with our partners a product and enable them and provide them with the MAP technology uh, to make them the way to the market finally and to come to commercial product. And that is reflected in the way on how the MAP program is being set up. So um, it uh, there are several kinds of structures in our organizational structure of the MAP program. Uh, one part is the MAP innovator and in this innovator we are focused on formulation development either with our proprietary projects or with the project of the corporation partners we execute here screening programs extended formulation work preclinical and clinical study and uh, develop our platform technology um, further and if needed we can also support uh, the project with the device development applicator and so on if being required um, the second part is the cdmo operation and there we are focusing on the future production of the LTS MAP technology, our proprietary technology, but we are also open for onboarding third party MAP technology and act here as a contract manufacturer for their MAP program activities. In this part, we are focusing on process development, either helping upscaling or performing a pure tech transfer. We would offer a manufacturing campus for aseptic uh, production as we foresee it for the microarray patch application. And we would support those activities with our established quality systems to provide a product which is meeting the state of the art quality requirements. And we can add additional CDMO services to that um, uh, CDMO operations um, from our outstanding engineering capabilities. We can support machine development and construction uh, to support and enhance uh, the progress in this MAP field, and we could add additional analytical service support uh, to enhance uh, the MAP program in that area. So, um, why, why, um, or what, what is our final goal? I think finally we would like to be a dedicated MAP development and manufacturing center of excellence. Um, and um, why are we also positioning ourselves in the MAP arena um, as a contract manufacturer because when we made the analysis of the current situation, we are seeing that there are a lot of startup and university with very smart ideas, with very successful preclinical and clinical studies, but with limited industrial experience and production. 
And that is, I think, where, where we see our core strengths uh, to support those companies which are struggling with limited process development and industrial production capabilities with our knowledge, with our background, uh, with our capabilities in respect to support the commercialization of the MAP technologies. And we would like to act as a kind of um, enabler for the pharma companies um, then together with us to find a way to the market and, and to commercialize the MAP technology. Yeah, so we, we feel we can fill the gap and be a trusted partner for process development and scale up um, through all the phases till um, finally commercial supply. Um, and that would, would um, en en enclose also feasibility studies, formulation and process development, clinical support, up to large scale manufacturing. So similar to that, what May already presented before, uh, which is our philosophy and uh, a third party with their own MAP program could join us at any stage in that development. And we would be um, open and willing to support also the upscaling of a, um, a third party MAP program. So um, we feel that with our capabilities, we can leverage and act as a process development and manufacturing accelerators for those companies, because we have um, a state of the art GMP R&D center in which we can manufacture MAP in a GMP quality to provide it to clinical uh, studies. Um, so we have also regulatory experience because we are in constant exchange with our local German health authorities. We had already scientific advice meetings and we are continuously inspected by our local health authorities here in Germany. We have an established network uh, in respect to pharmaceutical manufacturing, academia, industrial partners with access to equipment makers and raw material suppliers. We have already established a pre-pilot uh, line successfully, and we have a concept for aseptic and sterile production. We have state-of-the-art quality system, uh, including our own microbiological lab to support um, provision of clinical samples into clinical studies. And we have a lot of experience with um, execution of preclinical studies and also clinical phase one and two studies. And I think um, we have a proven track record that we have a GMP production capabilities for our TTS and OTF, and we would like to come to the same level than for our microarray patch program. And there, I think we, we can offer our capabilities, our track record um, for the implementation of innovative new drug technologies to enhance the MAP development and bring the technology to the market where, fe where we feel she would address an unmet medical need. So now let's dig into, into micro needle technologies or the LTS proprietary micro needle technology, because if we are talking about micro array patches, I think we need to be quite careful because even if the same name is used, there are different kinds of technologies behind the name micro array patches or micro needles. So LTS decided themselves for the dissolving micro needles and they differ from the other technologies uh, on the market, especially um, in that way, that that you have here um, you have here the tips being formed from an API containing polymer which is penetrating the skin. Then the API containing polymer is quickly dissolved uh, within a couple of minutes, and then you can remove the remainder of the tips and the back plate, um, and then the API is being delivered into the human body. Um, that is different um, to other uh, microarray patch technologies in which you have a solid micro needle structure, which is used for the penetration of the skin and which is then being removed completely intact after the application. So if you see it here for the solid removable micro needles, I think you see you have the solid micro needle structure, you remove it and you apply a classical transdermal patch for the coated micro needles. You have that um, API containing polymer coated on the solid micro needle structure here. It's penetrating the skin and after penetration, um, the API with the polymer is being dissolved and then the micro needle structure is being removed. And then you have the hollow micro needles in which the solid micro needle structure is linked with a liquid reservoir, which is depleted during the application. And again, you have that solid micro needle structure, which is being removed. So that is the main difference of the dissolving micro needles that you don't have that solid micro needle structure. Um, we have some limitations in respect to the amount of API, the payload um, we can realize with this dissolving micro needles. So we feel that we can deliver independence of the design of the micro needles in a single digit milligram um, range, biologicals and vaccines. 
but if there is a need for delivery of larger quantities, um, we are also dealing with another kind of um, technology here, and that are so the so-called hydrogen forming micro needles, where you can deliver in a double-digit milligram area um, the API, um, and um, that I think is um, um, the technology we use if we need to um, deliver larger quantities of API. In this case, the needles are formed from a hydrogen forming polymer. Uh, after the insertion into the skin, uh, the hydrogen uh, forming microneedles are swelling. The water is being sucked up um, into a reservoir, which is loaded with the API. And then during the application time, this reservoir is con continuously depleted and the API is being delivered into the human body. Different from the dissolving microneedles, those patch patches or micro needles need to be worn then for a couple of hours or a couple of days in order to allow complete depletion of the reservoir. Um, why, why did LTS decide for the dissolving micro needle technology? We decided for the dissolvable uh, micro needle technology because we feel that is offering us an optimal API payload without relying on liquid reservoir. By the choose of the suitable polymers, we can play around with sustained and immediate release options. Due to the embedding of the API into the polymers, we get an improvement of the stability with the opportunity even to omit um, the cold chain or at least reduce the requirements for the cold chain. We have a shorter resistance time on the skin surface in compared to classical transdermal patch application, other microneedle technologies. And we have a high flexibility playing around with the density of the needle, the needle shape, the needle design, um, and then also play allows us to play around for sure um, with the uh, payload of the API in those microarray patches. Um, if we um, talk about um, the, the, the simplest microarray structure for dissolvable micro needles you see on this slide, that is just a microarray patch consisting of the needles of the tips um, and the backing plate, and they are being made out of the same API containing polymer that is then being covered with a cover patch consisting of adhesive and the backing to fix it or uh, adhere it to the, um, to the skin. And we are usually using that kind of monolayer microarray patch in the early development phase because it allows us to comparatively quickly move into preclinical and clinical studies because we don't need to invest a lot of time and money into a process development. We can manufacture those samples comparatively easy, but those samples have a at this advantage, we need then to address in later phases, maybe going into clinical phase um, two and three studies, because we know from our investigation that only two thirds of the tips are penetrating into the skin um, and only the API in that area, which is marked in red here, um, is then, um, is then uh, released uh, into the human body um, and can be, can be made available. Uh, whereas the upper part of the tips and the back plate um, is just being removed after the application and is not providing any kind of API into the human body. So in later development stages, we, we are focusing on a single tip dispensing step in which only two thirds of the tips are being loaded with the API containing polymer and the upper part of the tips and the backing plate are then made from a different polymer or the same per polymer just without API. And again, we have this kind of cover patch for the fixation on the human skin. So um, what are the, the, the steps in respect to manufacturing of our um, dissolvable micro needles? So the first step is always the preparation of a dispensing solution. Um, and um, there we can use the knowledge we have gained in development of transdermal or thin films technologies and also um, the whole equipment part we, we have established at LTS for, for different kind of purposes and, and challenges we are facing. In the second step, then, we have a dispensing step in which we dispense that solution into the molds. Um, then after the dispensing step, we have a trying or heating or curing step um, in which the, um, the, the micro needles are being tried and then demolded from the tried micro needles. So, um, and then we, we cover the microarray patch with this cover patch and we, 
we, we merge the cover patch with a blister that may be hard to see on your, on your screen, but that is this kind of gray line here. It's a kind of blister packaging, and that blister packaging is then protecting the micro needles from physical damages. Um, and then we, we seal that um, sample into uh, a packaging material in order to protect it from environmental factors such as humidity, moisture, oxygen, or whatever, and bring it as a quite simple concept into the first clinical studies. So um, we feel that the most critical step is that we need to ensure um, that we have a good content uniformity in our dissolvable microneedles. And there we see three key steps uh, we, we need to focus on in order to guarantee that finally we have a good content uniformity and a small batch to batch variation uh, between um, our um, uh, products we are going to manufacture for the clinical supply. In the first step, we need to assure that the dispensing um, solution is homogeneous. Um, and there we can easily implement some in-process controls, taking, um, taking samples at different spots of the mixing container and verify whether we had achieved a very homogeneous uh, um, solution uh, or whether we need um, to improve that. And we can also perform on that level intermediate product quality control testing, such as um, um, assay related substances, viscosity, solid content, and other parameters. Then I think the second quite important step is ensuring that we have a good dosing precision. That means that always the same amount of API is being dosed into the molds, and therefore we need a optimal printing or dosing technology. And also here we can easily verify um, whether, uh, whether the same amount is always being dosed into our molds. And finally, I think the critical part also is the, the quality and the precision of the molds we are using, um, because they are finally determining the shape of the micro needles um, and the volume of the, of the tips. And therefore, we perform quite intensive quality control testing of the molds we are receiving. And we are in very close contact of our mold supplier so that we um, can keep the quality which is being needed in order to have a high precision and a good content uniformity of our microarray patches. And um, we would like not just to claim that we can do that, but we would like to show you data. So um, in this slide, you can see um, for a biologic, but also for a small molecule, we had manufactured three different batches with the same manufacturing technology. Um, and then we have uh, randomly taken 10 samples out of the, the batches we had manufactured. And you can see that we have a very small standard deviation um, in, in, in the batch. And then we have a very um, constant batch to batch or very small batch to batch variation also between the batches. Um, and if you take a look um, at the content uniformity requirements of the European Pharmacopeia, all those batches would have met those requirements, um, which is um, uh, based upon the acceptance value of the European Pharmacopeia. So we can really produce very homogeneous um, um, MAP batches and with a very small batch to batch variance uh, between the different batches. So let's then go in the next slide um, to our expertise we can offer in the development um, of the MAP program. So we, we hold a manufacturing license uh, from our local health authority for the manufacture of microneedles. And to our understanding, we are the only company in in the European community having that manufacturing license. We have a very long experience with MAP formulation, process development and analytics. We have a lot of experience with manufacturing of MAPs for preclinical and clinical phase one and two studies, including um, generation and support for IMP, IMPD generation. Um, we have um, a concept for pre-pilot line is tap, uh, success, successfully established. We have our own dedicated microbiological lab we are in close exchange with our local health authorities and had already scientific advice meetings with them in order to get guidance on how to regulatory proceed um, with that technology. Um, we are backed up by a state-of-the-art R&D center with a long-term experience in small molecules, biologicals, and vaccines. And, oh, sorry, it was too quick. Um, and I think we, the MAP program and the technology enhancement is being supported by outstanding engineering support with our capabilities of in-house process and equipment development, even for the MAP program. We, we have 
And I think that's also quite important, a proven track record that we are able to establish new innovative drug delivery technologies on the market. Uh, what we have demonstrated in the past with our TTS and OTF and now would like to demonstrate with MAP. And we have then also the ability, capability and ability to cover global commercial demands. So I think LTS has a long-term commercial manufacturing experience and is a trusted partner for large-scale manufacturing and drug delivery systems. And the next big thing to come from our perspective should now be the MAP technology. So um, how do we characterize now the needles we have manufactured? So I think in principle, also here we can benefit from our experience with TTS and OTF. Uh, we are doing the same testing and can use um, the, the, the same um, uh, understanding in respect to content, purity, identity, disintegration, in vitro dissolution, stability. But since we are dealing here with, with peptide proteins, vaccines, um, and under aseptic condition, they additionally performed bioassay testing as well as microbiological investigations, which are a kind of extension of the usual program we use for our TTS and OTF. And one um, um, critical process parameter is quite important and unique for our dissolvable microneedle technology because, as I explained to you in the beginning, the microneedles are being formed by an API containing polymer. That means this API containing polymer is um, uh, important for the penetration of the skin, and therefore we need to verify that we have good structural integrity. That means that this API containing polymer is capable uh, to penetrate the skin and deliver the API. Uh, and therefore we perform structural integrity testing by a texture analyzer. That means we make a uh, compression of the microarray patches with a certain applied force. And then we, we measure the, the quantity of the compression. And based upon this value, we can verify whether the structural integrity of the needles is in that way that they allow to penetrate the skin, but not only immediately after manufacturing, that is also quite critical parameter during stability so that this capability um, to penetrate the skin is also maintained during the stability of the um, microarray patches. So we have we have shown to you now that that the microarray patches, or we claim that the microarray patches have some significant advantages, like a short application time. They are painless. They are easy to use. We can realize an optimal API load, especially for vaccines and biologicals. We can most likely um, avoid the cold chain, and we can generate a tailor-made product. So that is all the claims we, we made to you. And now in, in the second part, we would really like to support that statement, the claims we are making with clinical data, so that we are not just claiming that the technology can can deliver all um, of that things, but that, that we really have data to support our claims and that you can trust in, in the statements we are making. So LTS has recently um, invested a lot of money in the performance of the of preclinical and clinical studies just to demonstrate the suitability of the technology um, and, and uh, the fact that, that it would address the unmet, unmet medical need from our perspective. So we had successfully performed a preclinical study with a recombinant vaccine, um, and we just ended with that into uh, a clinical study, which Marcus will report later on. And we have also performed a successful preclinical study with a biologic. And these are the things we would like to show you now um, as data in the next slides and, and demonstrate that really the MAP technology is suitable for delivery of biologicals and vaccines. So uh, let's start with the preclinical study for the biological. And we selected beta interferon um, as a biological uh, for the performance of that preclinical study. So maybe some background information about interferon. Uh, better, um, it's a recombinant human interferon, has a molecular weight of 22.5 kilodalton, so it's comparatively large molecules, at least if you come from the transdermal arena. Um, it's produced by Chinese hamster ovarian cells with human interferon beta gene, and the amino acid sequence um, of that recombinant human interferon is identical to that of the natural human interferon beta. And the indication for the interferon is multiple sclerosa, either patients with a slow disease progression or patients with a relapsing uh, multiple sclerosis um, are, are usually um, using better interferon. The molecule is already comparatively long on the market. It, it's um, it's uh, nevertheless still a quite uh, 
big and important product, um, especially uh, the two uh, major players in that field, Biogen with uh, Avonex and Merck with Rebif, are still making a turnover of more than 1 billion US dollar with those products. So you can see, despite of the age, uh, there is still a big market for this better interferon. Why do or why did we choose a better interferon and why do we believe that that is a suitable biological? Um, I think keep in mind um, that that those people suffering from the disease need to apply the, the better interferon during the whole life. That means it's a lifelong treatment. Um, and therefore, um, we feel that especially in this case, the avoidance of needles, uh, the painless administration um, is a major progress in the therapy and would improve the adherence of the patients to the therapy because even if you only need to um, uh, admi administer the, the API once a week or once a month, nevertheless, if you do that during the whole life, I think um, that that really is not in favor of the adherence of the patient to the therapy. Usually patients being diagnosed for multiple sclerosis are quite young um, and they prefer that they can keep their normal way of living. So they, they would prefer most likely a microarray patch because it allows them a discrete application at any time, at any place, most likely by avoidance of a cool chain. So can, they can take the microarray patch to any place, to any activity and apply if being needed, vacation and whatever. We have less risk of infections and also less injection site reactions. Um, there's also some theory which we need um, to clearly tell it's only hypothesis um, that due to the fact that better interferon is interacting also with our um, immune system that may be due to the, um, the location of the API close to the immune competence cells to the skin there might be an um, advantage in respect uh, to the application via microarray patches and we have less undesirable side effects because we can avoid stabilizer adjuvants, um, which are used and usually in the liquid formulation. So therefore, we felt that the microarray patch would be a strong move forward um, in the still difficult, difficult application regimes for those patients who need interferon better uh, for, the, for the treatment of their disease. So um, the product design. Um, we, we generated two different prototypes, which had a slightly different composition in respect to the tips and uh, the back plate, but I think that is not of major importance for that presentation. Um, the major difference between prototype one and prototype two were that we used two different kinds of quick dissolving polymers, uh, just also to um, evaluate the impact of the polymers being used for the release properties. So. Um, after the manufacturing, I think the most important for us was we need to verify whether, um, whether the bioactivity of the beta interferon is still present after the manufacturing and the bioactivity is not being impacted by our manufacturing process. Therefore, we applied um, uh, the chapter three um, of the European Pharmacopé um, in respect to assay for interferon and that is a quite complicated test using HEP2 cells and the infectious encephalomyocarditis virus. And based upon the EU EEP monograph, the potency has to be between 80 and 125% uh, of the stated potency. And as you can see, for both prototypes, we were staying in the range so that we really could confirm after the manufacturing that our manufacturing process is resulting um, in, a, uh, in a stable uh, interferon beta um, containing microarray patch. We put then that microarray patch on stability to verify um, then also um, how, how that, that patch is performing um, during uh, stability and we put it on uh, stability at um, refrigerator conditions 2 to 8 degrees and ambient condition 25 degrees 60% relative humidity and you can see the, for the prototype one um, we had some variability, which is not that unusual for that kind um, of, of product. Um, we had some kind of variability, but uh, independent of the storage conditions, I think we had a comparatively stable product up to 12 months, independently, whether it's room temperature or the ambient condition. And for prototype one, we had seen that the product was quite stable in the refrigerator, but we did see some significant drop in the activity, the bioactivity, um, then over the 20, um, over um, um, at, at the ambient condition at room temperature. 
Another quite important parameter, as I mentioned in the beginning, is the structural integrity. That means we needed to monitor also uh, the water content of the samples, because if they take up too much moisture, they get soft and they don't penetrate the skin anymore. And if they um, lose moisture, they get brittle and then they can penetrate the skin either. So therefore, we, we, um, uh, we monitor the residual water content over 12 months. And you can see independently of the polymer being used, um, independently of the storage condition, we had a very constant um, water content so that the samples kept their structural integrity during the stability. The last parameter we are checking here is the penetration gap. Um, that is hard or a little bit difficult to explain. That means if you, if you push the microarray patch into the human body, um, you, you cannot, as I mentioned in the beginning, you cannot um, uh, penetrate uh, to the whole uh, length of the needles into the skin. So you have always a kind of ga gap between the upper part of the tips and the back blade, and that is being measured here. But you can see here independently from the uh, storage conditions and independently from the polymers being used, this penetration gap was quite constant with some variability due to the method so that we could also confirm by this test that the structural integrity of the samples is given. So we were quite confident and therefore we used that uh, formulations um, and moved with them into a preclinical study in mini pigs. And uh, we performed um, a, um, a mini pig study consisting out of six experimental arms. We used the two prototypes always with a low and a high dose. Low dose was two MAP, high dose was 10 MAPs in five animals. And as a comparison, we made the intramuscular and intradermal injection with the concentrated Avonex in three animals. And then you can see below, we took at certain time points and blood samples and measured the amount of beta interferon in the plasma of the, the gutting mini pigs we were using here, which had about a weight of 8 kg. So um, how, how did uh, we apply the materials? We applied them with an applicator. That means the, the mini pigs were sedated. We applied the micro error patch with the applicator here for the low dose with two MAPs. Um, and then the, the applicator was removed after five minutes. And then we left the patch usually stay overnight um, and remove then the patch after 24 hours. And you can see here, there is some slides. I don't know whether you can really good see that on your, on your slides. There's some slight redness where the MAPs were placed, but um, we did not see any body weight loss of the samples. We had no clinical findings. We had no mortality. And in principle, uh, the MAPs were quite well tolerated. We had some very mild erythema and only in one case, uh, edema, which also disappeared finally. And so we can say that, that the application was really well tolerated. So in this slide, I would like to show you the comparison between the intramuscular and intradermal injection. And you can see that there's in principle no difference between uh, those applications. And therefore, we limited uh, on the next slide in order to reduce the complexity that we all always compared the plasma levels being generated by the MAP only to the intramuscular injection. And you can see here, and that is quite ex exciting for us, that for the prototype one, um, there there with the low dose, that means with the application of the two MAPs, uh, we got almost the same plasma profile um, in comparison to the intramuscular injection. And with the high dose, the application of the 10 MAPs, we got even a significant higher plasma level um, of the beta interferon in the plasma levels. Unfortunately, that did not look that good um, for the prototype two, um, where we used, as mentioned before, a different kind of polymer. So independently, whether we applied the low or the high dose, uh, we didn't come close even to the uh, plasma levels being generated by the intramuscular injection of Avonex. So um, if you compare that, I think in that table, you can easily see um, that with the prototype one, with the low dose, we have comparable Cmax and AUC values in comparison to the intramuscular or intradermal injection. Um, and um, for the, the, the high dose with the 10 maps, we have a five time higher Cmax and AUC. So that's quite consistent. Whereas for the prototype two, um, we, we don't come neither with the low dose nor with the high dose close to the Cmax and AUC values, which had been generated by the intramuscular and intradermal injection. Nevertheless, I think um, as a um, 
as a summary for that mini pack study, we see that there is excellent local tolerability of the MAP technology that uh, we have demonstrated those correlation for both prototype one and prototype two formulation. The prototype one was more successful in respect uh, to targeting and achieving the same plasma level as we had done with the Avonex. Um, and I think we feel that we can demonstrate with those data that the MAP technology can provide better interferon um, um, in a comparable way and with similar plasma levels in comparison to the marketed injection. And with that slide, I think I would like to hand over to Markus, our experts for the vaccination study. Thanks, Frank. So I will take you through a study we did uh, with a hepatitis B vaccine in a clinical phase one. Um, to start off with, I have to give you a little disclaimer. Um, the data you're going to see are preliminary since the study is not finished yet. So we're still uh, in process of rounding that up. The safety visits, the final ones are still outstanding and the data have not been finally QC reviewed. The uh, molecule we looked at is a hepatitis B vaccine. It's um, the actual antigen is the surface antigen of the hepatitis B virus. Uh, again, 22.5 kilodalton in size, but it's arranged in uh, virus-like particles, quite huge molecules up to three megadaltons. Um, the whole thing is produced in Hanselberg cells. Um, and we use the bulk material, which we receive from a collaboration partner. So it's something that actually then later is made into a commercial vaccine. The only difference to the commercial product is that we use the bulk without any adjuvants. The clinical trial design. So we decided to run a hepatitis B booster study. So we're recruiting subjects that had been vaccinated in the past. We took uh, enrollment titus at day minus 14. The uh, participants received um, the booster and a, a T0 value was taken to get the baseline titus. We asked them to come back at uh, day 31 for the boost titus, and we will have a follow-up at day 180 uh, for safety measures. The clinical trial design, it was in healthy volunteers, so it's a phase one study. It's randomized open label in parallel groups. <clears throat> We recruited male and female participants that had been vaccinated in the past. So they had to um, show a successful vaccination against hepatitis B. We set a uh, tighter range in which the subjects had to fall. So we had a lower cutoff at 10 international units and an upper cutoff at 400 international units. Um, the reason we did that is um, for the lower cutoff, uh, particularly with hepatitis B, there are um, a certain percentage of the population that do not respond to uh, hepatitis vaccination. And to rule out that we don't see any titus, that it is our product, um, but it is the, the participant that simply doesn't respond to it. We excluded um, this part of the population. We set an upper limit to actually see the doubling of fourfold uh, increase required for a booster. We had two trial arms. So we, as Frank mentioned before, we have a device, so an applicator that we use um, with our product. And we compared that to a manual application. The reason here is, um, as you can imagine, if we don't actually need an applicator, that's more of a, um, an advantage to have. We had 20 volunteers per arm, and each of them received 20 micrograms of antigen uh, in this case, we had to split it in two MAPs, which is simply technical and had to do with the bulk concentration. The uh, dose they received is equivalent to a commercial hepatitis B vaccine. So how does that look like? Um, here in this picture, let me turn on the pointer. You see um, the participant before the patch is removed. So here, the clear part is the, um, the actual overpatch. The red dot in the middle is the microarray. And just for this study, um, we fixed everything with a overtape 
that was simply or just for this study because we left it on for 24 hours, which in a real product would not be necessary. After removing, you can see um, where the actual microarray was located and a little bit of the, the bandaid around. The application was uh, very well tolerated. So um, anonymously, the participants described the process as, very, as painless, so completely painless. And up to today, we don't have any adverse events or severe adverse events. The vaccine titus so on, on enrollment for the manual and the device application, um, um, we had enrollment titus of around 80 to 90 international units per liter. With the manual application, we were able to boost um, the titer uh, to a level of a geometric mean of 1,120, and with the device, even almost to 11,000 international units. In terms of fold increase, with the manual application, we achieve a geometric mean fold increase of 14 uh, times. With the device, it's even in 160 times. And you can see that some participants um, had really strong reactions. So uh, in this case, almost 4,000 fold increase in uh, vaccine titer. How does that compare to an injection? So we uh, compared this to data we had from a previous study where we used an Angeric B uh, shot, which is the standard at the, Euro the European community to vaccinate against hepatitis B. And we achieved a uh, vaccine title of around 325 on average. And you can see that even with our manual application, which is uh, lower than the device supported application, we are way above that. So with even with a manual application, we can um, achieve similar or higher levels of vaccine titer uh, compared to an injection. And one thing to really point out here, our product does not contain any adjuvants, unlike the Angerix B that was used. To sum that up, um, we can show that MAP vaccination um, is very well tolerated. Uh, actually described as completely pain-free. We were able to uh, vaccinate and induce a very high titer with and even without the use of an applicator. Um, MAP vaccination induces a very strong immune response. We do not require an adjuvant to achieve this kind of response. And that gives um, rise to the possibility of a massive dose bearing. So to sum that up, we can see and we believe that um, with an MAP, you can induce higher immune response than with a classic injection, and we don't use an adjuvant. We don't need an adjuvant there. That's all from my side, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for this presentation. And there's now time for our Q&A session. Just a reminder for the audience members that you can still send in your questions, but it looks like we've got quite a few questions coming through already. So um, I will start with the first one for today, which is, what is the strategic objective of LTS in the MAP ecosystem? Yeah, I think, um, I, I hope I addressed that already. I think on the one hand, we would like to develop our own uh, micro array patch technology of the dissolving micro needles uh, to bring that to the market, either with our proprietary developments and then find a commercial partner to commercialize that or work together as May presented in the beginning, uh, from the beginning with the API from, from uh, of a commercial partner, potential commercial partner to develop his API with our MAP technology. And on the other hand, I think we would like to follow or offer ourselves also as a CDMO for companies um, which are more startup likes and whatever, and which, which are looking for a partner then for scaling up and commercialization. So that, that is how we position ourselves in that ecosystem. Thank you very much. Another question that we have is, what do you see as the main advantage for MAP technology for A, biologicals and B, vaccines or 
mRNA. Yeah, Ma Markus, maybe you can start with the vaccination. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, the the advantage really there is dose sparing for one. So as we were able to demonstrate with the hepatitis B, you don't actually need that much of an antigen then compared to an injection, which is really great in terms of a pandemic situation, for example, where antigen is sparse and you have to really see that you can get vaccinated most more people with a single shot than you can do with an uh, with a classic way of doing it um. yeah. and i think also we see uh, the, the avoidance of cold chain or reduction of the requirements also as a as a quite important thing especially if you think about um, vaccination may maybe in in more uh, low and middle income countries or whether you may think about uh, vaccination um, uh, for for vaccines which require a very very strong cold chain or have very strong cold chain re requirements so i think that is also a, a advantage and the opportunity for self administration which which we understand is a long way to go to demonstrate but we see at least the potential here that that we could self administer the the, the maps then finally and for the biologicals, I think um, it, it's similar. I think we feel um, that uh, that um, that especially for for biologicals, where you need um, uh, your, the, the 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 whole lifetime, you need to apply injection. Uh, that is really impacting and reducing the compliance of the patient. I mean, vaccination, you do it one or two times or maybe a couple of times in your life now. Um, but uh, I mean, you can survive the, the, the needles and whatever, but if you routinely need to apply a, a needle injection in order to address um, your disease, I think that that is, is, is annoying the people. And additionally, also in this case, I think we feel that the discrete small patch being applied um, uh, offers a lot of opportunity for the people to keep their normal way of living, um, avoid call change, um, opportunity of self-administration so that they can really have a, a normal lifestyle. And I think that is the major advantage we are seeing here. Thank you very much. Another question that we have is, what do you see as major challenges for commercialization of the MAP technology? And will the MAP technology finally be price competitive in respect to the established injections? Yeah, I think that the major challenges is, from my perspective, we, there's not yet any kind of product on the market, and therefore we have two kind of challenges. One, and I think, is that, that we need to identify the regulatory requirements uh, to, to establish the technology on the market. And that is the reason why I said in the beginning, we are in close contact, at least with our German health authorities in order to find with them via scientific advice meetings um, a way on how how to 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 address that regulatory pathway we are also working in, in regulatory working group with other map uh, uh, companies uh, in order to, to find that way and, and find a way to the market finally and the second thing is uh, in respect uh, to commercialization we need to come um, to commercial process which is efficient and which is addressing uh, the things we can improve uh, respect from the cost perspective and the, and the stuff and we feel finally i mean it's hard since there's no commercial process currently to say anything about real pricing um, but i think we say um, that if you take into account the total cost, that means we, we will never get the same price as a syringe, most likely for $1 or whatever. But if you take into account the money needed, um, maybe for the additional API um, or the vaccines um, or the avoidance uh, because of the dose sparing, if you take into account the avoidance of the cool chain, if you take into account maybe the opportunity for self-administration, that we taking into account all those costs that we should be finally be uh, comparative or in, in competition to the to the classical injection from our perspective at least that is what we are targeting for thank you the next question is does lts only have the solving mn capability or are they able to mfg hydrogel types as well <laughs> Yeah, we, we are in principally, I mean, we are working here together with the Kuhn's University of Belfast, uh, the working group of Ryan Donnelly, uh, who invented those hydrogen forming microneedles. Um, and 
we just entertained a preclinical study with those hydrogen forming microneedles um, and are also working on the GMP process for that. So in, in principle, I would say yes, we, we could uh, manufacture hydrogen forming microneedles, at least for preclinicals. I think for clinicals, there is still um, some, some work to do, honestly. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have is, have any of these map-based products, yours or using other technology, been approved by EMA or FDA? Not from a commercial perspective. As I mentioned before, we, we, we got approval uh, for performance of clinical study, but not pro no product is currently on, on the market, as mentioned before. Um, but but we, we are in close contact with our regulatory agencies and also with other regulatory agencies uh, like the FDA. Thank you very much. And the next question, what is the regulatory route to getting these products approved? Approval as devices or as combination products? Yeah, I, see, I think, um, and Marcus can, can correct me, but I think we, we see that is a combination product um, uh, in this case. So we have, a, we have a medical device part, but we have also a truck product part. So we, in our system and how we are setting up our regulatory, our QA and, and quality system, uh, we are sure that we need to address also um, com combination product elements there. Um, um, and, and therefore, we are pretty sure that, that it will be treated as a, a combination product in, in the US, but also um, according to the medical device regulation guideline in, in, in Europe. So we, we are pretty sure that we need to fulfill those requirements. Thank you. And another question, probably the last one that we'll have time for today, is uh, how is sustained release um, achieved with MAP technology? Yeah, I, I think as, as I, I have shown um, in my presentation, you, you can see that the selection of the, 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 the polymers we are using for the manufacturing um, of, the, of the needles can impact uh, the dissolution properties. So I think there are opportunities and some smart ideas um, on how, um, how with, the, with the smart design of the microarray patches and the use of the polymers, you can play around with the dissolution behavior. So that is what we see as opportunity. Um, and, and also um, then I think um, with those hydrogen forming microneedles that we, that we can achieve a sustained release um, over a longer time. So, so that are the opportunities we currently see with our microarray patch technologies we can offer and we can apply. Thank you very much. Uh, quite a few questions came through. Uh, just a reminder for the audience members, your questions will be shared with the presenters and available to be answered later on. And um, if you are watching this webinar on demand, you can still send in questions as well. But that just leaves me to thank the presenters for this great session and to LTS for sponsoring it. To the attendees, tomorrow you will receive an email telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this event, or you can access this through our website, which is www.pmi-live.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye on the website just mentioned, and you can also follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates, or join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars PMI. Thank you very much, everyone, once again, and I hope that you have a great day.